Testing, testing. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, I think uh, we'll begin. It's a pretty straightforward uh, docket. We're just going to go through the practice problems for a mid-semester, mid-quarter uh, Calc 1 class. So yeah, let's begin. First problem is pretty simple. It's uh, just taking a bunch of derivatives. Let's apply to the 6. 3 over x squared. So if you're taking a derivative, what we see here is that, OK, this is a term with x, this is a term with x, and this has an x. But this term right here just uh, is a constant, so we know that it's going to die out, right? I think this is the only slightly tricky thing about this problem, is that this uh, pi to the 6 here looks a little bit scary. It looks like it might be important, but really it's just kind of there to trick you, right? This pi over 6 is not really any different for if this is uh, from being a 1 or a 2. It, uh, it's a constant, so it doesn't survive the derivative. But as for everything else, this turns into a 5x to the 4th. This is just the polynomial rule. And then you get a 1 half x to the minus 1 half. Uh, again, I said that the pi over 6 goes away, so that turns into a 0. And then this right here turns into a minus 3 over... Uh, how do I put this? Uh, minus 3, 2, x to the 3rd. Right, so I'm just using the, either the power rule or one of the uh, polynomial rules. You, you can also think about it as the quotient rule if you want. But uh, for things like this, you should know that uh, you should know that you can sort of just bump the power into the front. That's where the minus 2 comes from. And then it turns into an x to the minus 3 on the bottom. So this is just all it is. Uh, get rid of the 0, and uh, there you have it. It's a very procedural problem, just a very simple derivative. By the way, just doing a mic check, can the uh, two of you in the uh, chat hear me? By the way, we're recording right now and, in fact, uh, live streaming it, so just uh, let you know. Can uh, can anyone can you all hear me right now? Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Just checking. All right. So, any questions on the first one? I think it should be um, pretty straightforward. The next one is for w of t is equal to arctan of t. Now. I feel a little bit bad about this one because it's almost kind of memorization based. Um, arctan is not one of the most common uh, derivative rules you'll use, with the most common being like the polynomial, exponential, um, uh, product, quotient rules, sine, cosine. But it's sort of in the next tier of just a tiny bit rarer than that. But on a test, I think you'd be in a really bad spot if you were trying to rederive uh, the derivative of arctan. I think you should really just know the derivative off the top of your head. Um, this is one that they've covered in class, yes? Like, I'm pretty sure this is going to be in your textbook. Like, is this a new to anyone? Is this a total surprise? We've covered it. Okay, good. Yeah, this one is basically just a memorization-based one, right? And it's... Uh, I, I can show you the derivation. It's just... If you were doing that in the middle of an exam, you're probably in a really bad shape. Um, but yeah, the idea here is just 1 over 1 plus t squared, and then you plug in uh, w prime of 3 is equal to this thing. Yeah? Um, yeah, I'll say a little bit about where this comes from, just to hopefully demystify it a little bit, because I, I really don't like presenting something just completely out of the blue and just say it, memorize it, right? So I actually had to look this up earlier because uh, I don't know this, like, I don't, I wouldn't bother knowing this off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, it's not too, too bad. The idea is if you have, um, if you have, like, y is equal to the arctan of x, that means tan of y is equal to x, right? So then you kind of just implicit, uh, implicitly differentiate both sides. Maybe this is not such a bad exercise. But I, you should know at this point that I hopefully you know that secant squared of uh, y, excuse me, is the uh, derivative of tangent. 
and then you get a dy over dx coming in from the chain rule, and then you just get a 1 on the other side over here. So then just moving this to the other side, this becomes dy over dx. Screen's starting to lag a little bit. Sorry, just a second. I need to uh, quickly restart my screen a little bit. Um, this happens every now and then with my computer. It's a little unfortunate. I can thank Bill Gates for that. Um, yeah, so then you divide this, turning it into 1 over... This is, uh, this is really frustrating. My computer is frozen right now. All right, is it going to work this time? All right, so you divide it, and you get 1 over secant squared of y, and then you use the t identity 1 over 1 plus tan squared. And remember, we know that tan of y is equal to x, so this just becomes equal 1 over 1 plus x squared. So there you go. That's the justification for it. And you can kind of see that like everything you're going to be asked is not without, like not outside the reach of like a two minute calculation. But like remembering to do this in the middle of an exam might be a little bit tough. And uh, also knowing off the top of your head that the derivative of tan is secant squared is kind of another thing that you're better off memorizing. But that's honestly not that hard to calculate because tan is just equal to um, sine over cosine, right? Sine x or sine y over cosine y. And if you wanted to take dd, uh, the derivative with respect to y of this, right, this is just a simple application of the quotient rule, um, which will lead you to secant squared of y. I, hmm, yeah, I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but I just sort of want to emphasize that you're sort of at a unit now where you're not being asked to do the uh, limits anymore, which is hopefully a relief. But a lot of these problems are just really, really routine. Um, like mechanical tests that you know your rules. And just doing a couple of exercises of them, you know, won't hurt, but I don't feel like I can say any like magical thing that makes all of the um, problem, we wouldn't, couldn't even call it problem solving. This is honestly like the just grown up edition of just, sorry, the grown up edition of just like addition, right? This is just like the most routine calculations you can give to a student. So for this one right here, I will show you one little trick, though. I typically prefer to um, just avoid using the quotient rule entirely. I like to write this as e to the x times 1 plus 3x to the negative 1. And because I write it like this, I can you can kind of see that I'm going to use the product rule instead of the quotient rule. I guarantee it'll give you the same answer, but I just think it's a lot easier to think about, right? I, I hate thinking about squaring the denominator. But this turns into minus e to the x. 1 plus 3 to the x minus 2. And then you have to do a little bit of chain rule here, so you get a factor of 3 popping out. And uh, that's all it is. And you can verify yourself that if you did this with a quotient rule instead, you should get the same answer. But I think this way is a little bit easier. And to be honest with you, I don't really bother remembering the quotient rule off the top of my head either. Um, work it out for yourself, maybe work it out both ways. And uh, Choose whichever one you like more. Any questions so far? Okay. So for this one, just apply a single derivative. Um, yeah, ln of x is just one of the most common derivatives you need to know. It's just one over x. I don't actually know the I don't actually know the derivation of that off the top of my head. I would uh I would actually have to think about it for a moment or two. But uh, taking two derivatives, you get equal to minus 1 over x squared. Remember, this is just the quotient rule or the power rule or whatever you want to think about, right? You can think about this as x to the minus 1, and you can think about using the power rule to sort of bump down the minus 1 and then subtract another one from the uh, exponent, which is how you get to minus x to the minus 2. Yeah? Or again, you could use the quotient rule or whatever you want, really. Our e, we have r theta is equal to sine theta. Ah, okay, so here's the first one that requires a tiny bit of problem solving. Um, any input on this one? Is this one that uh, the student joining us, is this one that you have uh, have an idea of how to do? 
You know, I'll try to make it conversational. If you don't want to talk, you don't have to. I remember this one. Um, yeah. It was like on a practice problem, and it's like you have to solve it, I think, maybe up to the fourth. Yes. And yes. then, like, you find a pattern. Exactly. Exactly. To, I think, like, 24, and then you can figure out 24. Exactly. So, like, the last thing you want to do on a test is to actually take 25 derivatives, right? So, we're hopefully going to look for a pattern here. And we remember that. Um, every time you take a derivative, like each of these arrows here represents a derivative. Going from sine theta to cosine theta is a derivative. And then you go to minus sine theta. And then you go to minus cosine theta. And then you go back to, uh, and then you go back to square one, sine theta. So basically this is like saying, if this is derivative zero, like the original thing you can think of as derivative zero, right? Derivative one is cosine, derivative two is minus sine, derivative three is minus cosine, and then derivative four, you end up right back at zero. So that's the idea. So if you really wanted to, you could just like quickly count to 25 and see which one of these you land on, and that'll be our answer right there. Um, or we could do it maybe just a little bit more cleanly and remind ourselves that 25, um, you know, if we, tw it's called the modular division, and it sounds really scary, but it's not that bad. It's basically saying to take 25, divide by uh, four and take the remainder. Right? Take the remainder. And the remainder here is equal to one. So one is going to be your answer. And maybe you should go in and, if you're watching later, convince yourself why exactly this uh, uh, works out. Like, if you really did count to 25, I guarantee you would, you would end right there. But uh, please don't count to 25 in a real test. That would take way too much time. Yep. Hmm. Hopefully that's uh, sufficient enough of an explanation, right? Because basically every multiple of four, you land back on sine theta. So once you get to 24, you would land on sine theta. And the next one would be 25, would be cosine. That's the sort of more verbal explanation. Alrighty. How do you feel like, um, do you feel like the class is pretty comfortable with tangent lines at this point? Because I remember you were asked to do a ton of them in the previous assignments, if I remember correctly. I think a lot of people were very scared about uh, finding the, uh, what do you call it? Just finding the equation of the line because they just see it in the context of calculus and it's suddenly they're very scared and forget what they do know from earlier classes. But the idea here is x's and the y's are very much intermingled. So don't try to solve for y first. That's going to be a huge pain. Instead, we're just going to go ahead and differentiate implicitly, which is basically to say take ddx of both sides. All right? So in doing that process, we get 2x plus, okay, so this one is going to have to use a little bit of chain rule. It's going to turn into 2 pi. Sorry, 2 over pi. Minus sine pi y times pi. Uh, in particular, these pi's are going to cancel out. And then we're going to have to use a little bit of, oh, excuse me, and I forgot there needs to be a chain rule from dy dx here. All right, because you have a y in there. And basically, implicit differentiation is if you see an x, you take its derivative and you don't have to worry about it any further. But when you see a y, you need to put a dy dx from chain rule. And then this turns into a 4y. Uh, by chain uh, by product rule. So what is this? If you take first the derivative with respect to x, okay, it just turns into 4y, and then it becomes a plus 4x, I think, dy over dx. And that's equal to 0 on the other side. I think that looks right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, yeah, at this point, you can try to isolate for dy over dx right now if you want. But I would suggest plugging in the points in first at this point uh, with x comma y equal to one comma one half and seeing if you get any any nice cancellation that makes your life a little bit easier. And it turns out that you do. I think this turns into two minus, well, this turns into a minus two and plugging in the one half turns into a sine of pi over two. So the sine just becomes a value of one and this turns into a dy dx. And then you get plus four times a half, which is just two, plus, I think this just turns into a four, x is one, and then dy dx. So I believe this turns into four is equal to two, uh, minus two dy dx, or dy over dx is equal to minus two. I think that's right. 
So at this point, we know what the slope is. And I think something students might make the mistake of, uh, you know, lack of confidence, I would rather say at this point is, okay, they see this minus two, and then they see about something about, they think about to the original equation, like, oh my God, this is so complicated. What do I do with this number at this point? What do I do now? And I want to remind you that at this point, it's all middle school math or maybe high school math being generous. You have a slope, right? This is the slope of the tangent line because the tangent line has the same slope as the derivative at that point. And then you have a point that the line is going through. This is all the information you need. Like, I don't want you to even think about the original stuff anymore because the original stuff was describing some really, really complicated curve that ends up at like one comma a half. Sorry, one comma one half. But we got all the information we needed from that, right? We found the slope and now we know the uh, line at a point. So at this point, it's just y is equal to mx plus b time. You don't have to worry about the original equation at all anymore. We've got what we needed from it. So, you know, I trust you to take care of the rest on your own, whoever is watching this as a student, but just plug it into y is equal to mx plus b or plug it into a uh, slope intercept form and this will this still take care of everything you needed. Excuse me. This, uh, this should be everything you need. Yeah, remember just dy over dx, that's the same thing as m. It's literally slope, uh, it's literally uh, behind the equation of a line. Now, maybe I should motivate this a little bit. Um, I don't know how often your professor talks about stuff like this, but this might seem like the most artificial exercise in the world. Like, okay, we have a, we have a curve, right? Why are we so obsessed with uh, trying to find a line next to it? Like that's such an arbitrary process, right? And it turns out that this is one of the most useful things in physics, engineering, anything, you know, anything remotely applied. Because with really, really complicated functions, sometimes all we can say about it is just approximate it really, really close by, which is to say that, okay, for values very close to it, sorry, for values very uh, similar, excuse me, for x values very close to one, it's basically saying the points on this line really, really match the points on the curve pretty darn well, as long as you don't deviate too far away. And that kind of, they call it first order approximations or linearizations, useful everywhere. Right. If you even if you don't go further in math and you do something in biology instead, even a process like this could reasonably be useful just to approximate a uh, trend line or something like that. Um, anyways, that's a little divergence there. I just want to really make emphasize that this is not an arbitrary process. It's actually super motivated. But uh, I digress. So now we're talking about a cylinder. And we have volume is equal to pi r squared times h, where r is our radius here and h is, of course, the height. And we, we know what radius is. We know that radius is 5 uh, meters. And we also know what the water is being filled at a rate of 3. So that means you always just got to get good at interpreting these problems. So that means dv dt is equal to 3 meters cubed per minute. So it's always good to sort of write out the equation relating the variables, write out what you know, and write what you want to find. And in this case, just interpreting from the problem, we're trying to find dh dt, which is the, uh, how fast is the height of the water increasing? That's basically asking the change of, uh, excuse me, the change of height with respect to time, dh dt. And uh, it turns out that this is a reasonably simple uh, derivative. Because we just look at this expression right here, v is equal to pi r squared h. And the idea is, let's just take ddt of both sides. ddt. So the left-hand side, okay, I'll just write it down here, becomes dv dt. Right? That's exactly uh, one of the things we knew earlier, so this is looking good so far. And the right-hand side, okay, the pi is not going to be affected by the... Uh, uh, the pi is not going to be affected by the, uh, what do you call it? The derivative. So now we have r squared and h. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we need to use the product rule? And that basically comes down to, okay, we know that h is going to be a variable. Is r a variable or is it constant? And in a situation like this, you kind of have to remind yourself, um, just go back to what the problem is saying, right? You're kind of told that the container is fixed. So presumably r is not changing. So r is a constant, which is to say that it doesn't get really affected by the uh, derivative. You can just treat it as a constant. So the only thing being affected by the derivative is h, dh dt. 
So at this point, right, because I'm I'm trying to put myself in the mind of a student looking at this for the first time, and I would imagine that a student might, um, you know, a, a student, an overeager student might treat R as a constant, sorry, R as a variable, and they'd get into this really messy situation of trying to do 2R dr over dt times h plus r squared dh dt. I guess this is all multiplied by pi, right? It turns out that this technically isn't wrong because dr over dt is zero. And you just recover exactly what we had before. But I imagine that a student looking at it for the first time isn't going to have, if, if they get to this point, they might shoot themselves into the foot trying to panic and figure out what dr dt is. And, you know, they're not going to, you know, maybe they don't have the, quite the confidence to say it's zero and they feel like they're missing something, right? R is a constant, so I would say don't even go down this path. Don't even use the product rule. And instead, just take the derivative and keep it simple. Just dhdt. Anyways, I try to put myself in the mind of a student sometimes and try to organically um, ask myself what a student seeing this for the first time might be confused on. You know, that's one of the things that I think would come to mind because R looks like an important variable. But for this particular problem, it's not. Any questions so far? Oh, sorry. I guess I just finish off the rest, right? So we know dvdt, and we know pi r squared, right? We, we literally, these are all just genuine, you know, honest to God numbers. We can literally just divide and then solve for dhdt. And we're done. Uh, anything so far? Okay, uh, let's just go through and quickly chug through these integrals. Or sorry, I keep saying integrals, that's next semester. Rather, derivatives. So we have f prime, we're asked to find the derivative for each, and we say we don't have to simplify. So if f of x is equal to ln of 1 plus 3x squared, well, you take the derivative, and this turns into, okay, well, ln of the argument just turns into 1 over the argument. But then we have to remember that chain rule has to apply, right? So chain rule tells us we need to take the derivative of what's inside and multiply it uh, out here. So, okay, the 1 goes away because it's a constant, and this just turns into 6x. And there's your answer. It just turns into 6x over 1 plus 3x squared. That's all. f of x. Next one is e to the x, uh, x cubed minus x to the 12. Well, okay. The derivative is using the product rule. I'm going to first take the derivative of e to the x, which is just itself. So that's not even a big deal. And then using the uh, product rule, now I have to take the derivative of the other part. So this turns into a 12 e to the x, x cubed minus x. Uh, and that's going to be raised to the 11th, right? because it's just going to be the uh, power rule, or is it polynomial rule? And then we have to apply chain rule. So the argument in here becomes 3x squared minus 1. And then we're done. That's all. That's your genuine answer right there. It's nice that they don't even require you to simplify. But okay, then. The next one is just a little bit nastier than the others. It's not particularly bad but sine of cosine of tan. If you take the derivative, this turns into cosine of the first, you know, it's sort of like cosine of the first layer. And then the argument stays intact. We're going to chain rule it afterwards. All right, so all I've done it the first time is sort of apply the derivative um, to the outermost thing. All right, that sine turns into cosine. And then we got to multiply by the chain rule of the argument, which is, okay, derivative of cosine becomes minus sine of tan of x. Right? And at this point, I need to apply the chain rule again to what remains on the inside. And that just turns into tan of x turns into secant squared of x when you take the derivative. So yeah, you just multiply this all together, and that's your answer right there. Right? So it's cosine of cosine of tan of x times minus sine of tan of x times secant squared of x. That's all. 
Alrighty, so now we get an exercise where we actually get to use the linearization we talked about earlier. But we get 5 of x is equal to root of x plus 99. And we're asked to do this at a is equal to 1. So this is exactly the linearization concept we were talking about uh, earlier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we basically just need to find the... So problems like this, I'll break it up into a couple steps, right? One is find the tangent line. Mm, I guess we'll call it find the tangent slope at a is equal to 1. Uh, well, I guess <laughs> x is equal to a equal to 1, and then y is equal to f of a. Right? And then 2 is find the equation of the tangent point, uh, tangent line. Yeah, tan line. And you can get that from the slope, as well as the fact that you know an x and a y value that it passes through, right? You can get the equation of a line from a point and an xy coordinate. And then three, just... Let's see, we're using this to approximate 102, right? So we're going to say approximate square root of 102 which is basically when uh, x plus 99, so this is basically going to be 102 when this is equal to x is equal to 3, right? So that basically says when you finally have a tangent line, y is equal to mx plus b, and you know m and you know b, this is just saying, okay, well, let's just go ahead and plug 3 into that, and then that's our answer. So we're going to go through this. Uh, the very first step is finding the tangent line, or the slope of the tangent line, rather. And uh, of course, we're going to use our handy technique, the derivative for that. So this is just f prime of x is equal to 1 half x plus 99 to the minus 1 half. That's it, right? No chain rule even necessary. So OK, this is the general formula for the derivative, but we need to go ahead and plug in uh, x uh, at, you know, x is equal to 1, basically, right? So f prime of 1. Like, they always do this, like, kind of... I've always found this a little bit silly, but they say a is equal to 1 instead of x is equal to 1 because they want to make it doubly clear that you're kind of plugging in something, right? And a seems like a constant. But, like, really what you're doing is you're just sort of plugging in the value of 1 for x. Um, so then this turns into just what? Oh, by the way, this is, of course, the negative exponential is just 1 over the square root of x plus 99. So this turns into 1 over the square root of 100 is equal to 1 over 20. Okay, so now this is our slope, right? This is just m in mx plus b. Okay, so then we, well, I mean, I feel a little bit silly explicitly doing out a, um, excuse me, I feel a little bit silly explicitly doing out a uh, point slope problem, but here we go. Right, so I need to know the point, right? So we know that x is equal to 1. What is y equal to? So that's f of 1, which becomes square root of 100, which just becomes 10. So the point in question here is 1, 10. That's your x and y value. So 10 is equal to... Um, excuse me, right, mx plus b, x is 1, so that turns into 1 over 20th times x is 1 plus b. Eh, these numbers are really nasty. I hope I didn't make an arithmetic mistake somewhere. But it looks like minus 1 over 20 is equal to b. And uh, I guess this just turns into 199 over 200. Sorry, 199 over 20 is b. And as a sanity check, you should be able to... Okay, so now we have b and we have 1 20th, right? We should be able to plug this back to y is equal to mx plus b uh, for this 1 comma 10, and it really needs to work out. Um, we can also plug it... Sorry, because these two equations... Because this uh, y is equal to mx plus b and f of x agree at the point of tangency, really we're supposed to be able to use uh, either one. Oh, I'm sorry, my back is really hurting for a second. 
sorry, what am I, what am, what am I saying? Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, you can just go ahead and plug this back into the equation here. So this turns into 10 is equal to 1 20th times 1 plus 199 over 20. And uh, yeah, that looks like it checks out. So it's just a nice little sanity check. It's really not doing much. I just like to double check to make sure we didn't make an arithmetic error. An arithmetic error. Um, but yeah, at this point, we know what M is, and we know what B is. So now we just go ahead and, what did we say earlier? Uh, we're saying, we're, now we're in step three, approximating root 102. And this is basically just approximately equal to X plus 99 for when x is equal to 3, right? I guess maybe I should write that out a little bit more. So root 102 is equal to the square root of 3 plus 99, right? And that's approximately equal to... Um, that's approximately equal to... What is it? What is it? Uh, y is equal to 1 20th x plus 199 over 20. So yeah, at this point, you just plug in 3 here. And you should get that uh, y is approximately 202 over 20. Sorry, my work is getting a little bit messy here. But yeah, if you plug in x is equal to 3, get that y is equal to 202. And that would be your final answer. That would be your approximation. And yeah, as a sanity check, right, we know that at a is equal to 1, this thing kind of looks like, you know, it has a value of like 10 right there. So just a little bit to the right of 1 should get us just a little bit more than 10, which is what we have over here. So, you know, at a glance, it seems right. Okay. So then there's 6. Uh, this problem right here is these half-life problems are kind of weird because to derive the formulas, you use a bit of calculus, but for this particular problem, you don't actually need any calculus, I don't think. Have any of you looked at this one yet? Like, I, I don't think you actually... Like, all you need is algebra. But if you have a 1,024 milligram sample, and it has a half-life of 50 years, so you're asked to find the mass remaining after 150, right? Well, 150 uh, years times 50 years to one half-life means you get three half-lives, right? And you should be able to know from your half-life equations that, like, A is equal to A naught times E to the What is it exactly? Minus t, I think it's just over the half-life, like 50, where a naught is 1024. I'm sorry, this should be a 2. My, what did I say that? It should be a 2, not an e. Um, yeah, so just when checking this equation, right, when t is 0, when t is 0, this just means a is equal to a naught, which is right. It's like the amount you have at the start is the amount you have at the start, right? But then for t is equal to 50, this thing becomes 2 to the negative 1. So that's like a is equal to a naught times 1 half. So that's exactly what you want. So really what you do here is just plug in 50 to this equation, and you'll get a is equal to a naught times 2 to the minus 3, right? This is where that 3 came from. I just sort of did the explanation again. And uh, yeah, you plug in 1024 here and then you're done. That's really all there is to it. And the next part of that question asks when it decays to 30 milligrams. So now instead of knowing the time and finding the amount, we now know the amount and are trying to find the time. Which is to say that we know that A is equal to 30, and now we solve for T. And uh, yeah, that just turns into 30 is equal to, I guess, 1024. That's your A naught, right? Times 2 to the minus T over 50. 
So the solution for this just becomes 30 over 1024, 2 to the minus t over 50. And then at this point, you need to take a logarithm to undo the exponentiation. So if you take the log 2 of both sides, 30 over 1024, and the right-hand side, the 2 just goes away. This turns into 2 over 50, uh, minus t over 50, right? Because of log 2 of 2 to the something all just becomes that something because the log and the exponentiation cancel out. Well, okay. At this point, you just multiply by minus 50, and, uh, and you're done. Is equal to t. At this point, you might be really scared because you say, oh my gosh, there's a negative sign. What the heck? We can't have a negative time, can we? Well, not so fast. Uh, it actually makes sense because the thing in here, um, 30 over 1024, um, is a value smaller than 1. And the logs of positive values smaller than 1 is negative. So this here is a negative as well. So the negative and negative cancel out, and we actually have an answer that makes sense. Okie dokie. We're pretty much getting to the end here. Uh, any questions? Uh, I always stop and ask, but I feel like most of this stuff is straightforward. Um, but then again, I realize that as someone who is reasonably experienced with calculus, I, I shouldn't just assume that. Um, I do have a question. Please go ahead, sure. Um, so I'm looking at an example that we did um, in class one time in a discussion, and we plugged in. So it says a five kilogram sample with a half life of 500 years, and we got the equation two six t over 500. Sorry, I'm having a really hard time hearing you because your mic keeps going in and out. Can okay. you say that again? Um, yeah. So it says a five kilogram sample okay. with a half life of 500 years. 500 years? Yeah. And then so the equation that we wrote was AT equals five two to the negative T over 500. Mm -hmm. And then he plugged in 500 for T. So is that just because it's like one half-life in that sense? Sorry, uh, so you said that you started with 500? Yeah, it says a five kilogram sample. Oh, five kilograms. Sorry, I misheard you. Five kilograms. Yeah. Yeah. And then so we plugged in 500. But I'm saying here in this equation, you plugged in, or like for, for the exponent, we got three instead of one. So I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah, so uh, let me ask what else is... Did they say how long? What else did they say in that question? Did they say how long they were waiting? Oh, how long till one kilogram is left. Until one kilogram is left, gotcha. So that's really similar to part two of the problem we just did. Um, so this equation right here corresponds to this equation right here. Um, right, except for we've already plugged in A is equal to 30 at this point. And uh, here we would just plug in... 1 is equal to 5 times 2 to the minus t over 500. And at this point, everything, the process is exactly the same. We divide through by 5, which we did over here, right? We divide through by the initial mass. We take the log of both sides. So we get log 2 of 1 fifth is equal to minus t over 500. And then we would multiply by minus 500 to isolate the t. So it's the exact same process, really. Oh, okay. That helps a lot. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, with the... Uh, I guess in your first time seeing these things, right? Um, after seeing a couple of different examples and figuring out uh, what corresponds to what, you should hopefully see what moving parts um, are kind of like independent of each other, right? Like this mass right here uh, is the amount you start with, and that's independent of the half-life, really. Um, you know, they can kind of just be given separately by uh, the problem giver. Okay, so the very last one is, I'm getting some propensity for the teacher to try to interject some uh, real-world logic, which I, well, in some sense is good because you want real-world applications, but it also requires a little bit of assumptions, and assumptions in math are kind of, math should not be vague. Anyways, so C of S is the total cost in dollars of building a home with s square feet. So you're being asked, what are the units of c prime of s? Right? And 
without giving this away, right? You know, I'm going to do an analogy first. Um, if you have just position, like someone's just walking along on the uh, coordinate plane, right? If someone's just walking along on the, uh, let's call it the x-axis, right? At some speed, um, we can say x of t is their uh, position. Let's call it position in meters uh, with time t, at time t. And we all should know at this point that x prime of t is the velocity, right? Which we all know is meters per second. So t is in seconds. And I kind of want you to see just like sort of how this comes about, right? Because x prime of t is basically dx dt. So this is basically an infinitesimal, right? This is an infinitesimal. But look at the units right here. The units right here happen to be meters up top and seconds in the bottom, which perfectly match up with what's happening over here. So what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say that even though the derivative, this, is, this fraction bar here is not a division sign, right? There's a more rigorous explanation. It's not literally division. But for some purposes, especially with units, you can kind of think of it like division. Um, maybe another way to say it is instead of saying an infinitesimal change in x with respect to an infinitesimal change in dt, you can maybe say just like a small but finite change in x. Let's call it delta x over delta t. And if I called, say, delta x over delta t, most people would understand at this point that I'm talking about if you have time versus position, right? And you had some curve here, maybe look like that. Delta x over delta t basically just means the rise over run. Yeah? This is the change in x, and this is the change in t, rise over run, like you've done in a, a high school or middle school. And uh, you can kind of see the units here of rise over run have just got to be meters a second, right? Because it's the vertical units first, which is meters, and then horizontal units after, which is seconds, so meters a second. So the analogy that I'm kind of making here is C prime of s is basically dc over ds. And I'm sort of saying to you, you can basically just read off the units right here from the C and from the S, like we did, like we did over here. So that is to say the answer for the units ought to be uh, dollars per square feet, I guess. And just don't be fooled by the fact that, you know, there's a square here and there was no squares over here. Um, it's just because it's just given to us that s is in square feet. Right? Feet squared. Like, you can imagine being an alien who doesn't know English at all, um, but is just really, really good at calculus. And all they're doing is just symbol recognition, and they have no idea what any of this is saying, um, or what the dollar sign is. They just literally just put in the units over here and have no understanding what it is, but it's right. You know what I mean? So like... I'm trying to, again, to put my um, mind into the mind of a student who might ask why there's a squared there. And it's just because there was a square originally given, and we're just transporting it right over. Um, what else is there to say? If they asked you about, like, C double prime of S, it's much the same thing happens. Um, C double prime of S uh, just basically becomes D squared of C over DS squared. And the idea is the C on the top is still sort of by itself. So it's still sort of just dollars on its own. But then the bottom becomes the squared of whatever it used to be. So it becomes feet squared, squared, or basically feet to the fourth. I'm just answering that because I feel like that's a pretty natural extension and maybe helps a student understand better. But, you know, it's not being asked on the original set, problem set, or midterm, or practice midterm. But it's exact same idea with meters a second velocity, right? The derivative of velocity becomes acceleration, which is d squared of x over dt squared. And in the similar way, that's just meters over seconds squared. Yeah. Um, to, to the student with us, uh, does that explanation make sense? Does this demystify the units a little bit, or w was that a was that an easy concept to begin with? I don't know. Your explanation helped because I had no idea how to do that before that. Oh, really? I'm really happy then. Okay, great. Yeah, no. Um, like Isaac Newton 
uh, as I understand it, didn't really understand the limits back when he invented calculus. He just liked to think of um, putting in an infinitesimal on the top of a fraction and an infinitesimal on the bottom of a fraction, like a small delta x and a small delta t. So when you think of it that way, it's like a perfectly genuine meters over a second, right? So then it's basically as you take the limit as x and t get smaller, right? You take the limit and that turns into dx over dt and People insist on teaching calculus this way because it's a little bit more rigorous. But to be honest with you, I feel like I didn't really understand uh, a lot of calculus until I started taking physics, where they were a little bit looser on the rigor, but gave you more intuition as to what this actually meant, like a little, like a little x over a little t, right? Because over here, this is a fraction bar. But over here, this is no longer a fraction bar in the rigorous sense. <laughs> but... You know, in certain contexts, like fract like units, you can still think of it as that. I, I hope I hope that little tangent was not too confusing. Or, um, anyways, I'm I'm always a big proponent of physics. I feel like it. I like physics a lot, and I also think it helps people understand math better. But anyways, so you can probably guess what the second part is at this point. But if over here we had um, velocity is basically the change of position with respect to time. Right, C prime of S should be the change in the cost with respect to square footage. If you want to interpret it a little bit more concretely, it's kind of like saying, um, if you want to interpret it a little bit more concretely, it's kind of like saying what would be the cost um, to add in another extra square foot, um, depending on where S currently is. But yeah, okay, for the very last one, when you ask whether C prime of S is positive or negative, uh, this is where we get into a having to use a little bit of real-world logic rather than um, strictly math. And to be honest, I think problems like these do not belong on a calculus test. But okay, um, they're basically asking you, do you expect the derivative, which again is the cost per um, adding an extra square foot, to be... Sorry, how do I put it? Okay, so like, let's think about just cost per square foot compared to just square foot, right? So let's say that it costs, you know, some amount of money at a thousand square feet. It's basically saying, do you think it would point upwards or downwards, the, the slope? To add in another square foot, would it cost more money? More overall money or less overall money? And I think that it's leading us towards saying it would cost more overall money, right? Because the bigger the house is, the more expensive it is usually. It would be kind of strange to have a house that the bigger you build it, the cheaper it gets. Right? But again, this is just kind of real world intuition. This is arguably not really math. Anyways, I think that's all for the practice midterm. Any, uh, any other questions? I think a student asked me a related rates question from one of the homework problems, which I'll cover. Um, but, uh, sorry, anything else from the midterm first? Okay. So the problem I was being asked to cover was saying, okay, let's say you have like a 15 foot tall pole. Um, and let's say that you have a person of height uh, six uh, feet tall, and it says that they're kind of like walking away at some given speed. I'm gonna make up a number. I'm gonna make up a different number. Let's say it's five meters per uh, or let's say the speed is five feet per second. So it's basically asking how fast is the tip of the shadow increasing? I actually had to think about this for a moment because I was a little bit confused because his shadow is really only this part, right? But like the increase in this part over here sort of is like saying, how does the length of the entire leg of the triangle change as this, as he moves out, right? Because as he's walking along, let's say he's close, he starts off really close, and then as he walks out, the shadow cast gets further and further and further away, right? So basically the idea is, you'd kind of expect that there'd 
would be a somewhat interesting relationship between the rate at which the you know shadow moves to the right. Let me put it this way. We're not being asked to change as sorry. Let me put it this way. The problem is a little bit confusing because we're not quite being asked to calculate the length, sorry, the rate of change of length of his shadow. But rather, it's kind of asking us to calculate the rate of change of length of the shadow plus the rate at which he's moving. Yeah? It's, uh, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a subtle concept, and I had to sort of, relativity is always a little bit confusing. But, like, imagine that instead of, it's not strictly talking about the, um, rate his, gosh, I, I don't know, it's just kind of hard to explain this using words, but it's just sort of like there are two factors here, right? It's both his shadow is getting longer, but also he's kind of moving with it. He's kind of moving with that shadow. And you sort of have more than one factor. And it's kind of hard to give an example to isolate this effect down, because, um, I don't know. L like, let me bring up another example, right? Like, let's say there's no, uh, it's not night, it's said it's day, right? It's day and the sunlights are coming down perfectly horizontal. And uh, the guy's shadow is... I don't know. Okay, maybe it's not coming down perfectly horizontal. Maybe it's coming down at a consistent angle so that the guy's shadow stays constant length, right? Even though the shadow is staying constant length, if he's running, then the tip of the shadow is still moving, right? Now, let's say that the guy is standing perfectly still. He's not moving, but the sun in the sky um, is changing angle, right? This is the sun, and it's sort of changing angle as it goes along. So first, his shadow is not very long, then it gets longer, then it gets longer, then it gets longer, right? So the idea here is, just from the changing position of his body relative to the light, the shadow increases, you know, the shadow goes to the right, but also from him running, the shadow also goes to his right. So there's sort of two effects going on here at once, and you need to account for both of them. That's kind of what makes this problem a little bit challenging. But okay, let's just go ahead and do it, right? So if we call this part right here L, and maybe this part right here, um, I, I don't know, uh, X maybe? The quantity we're trying to find is D of L plus X over DT, which is the same thing as DL DT plus DX DT. Because, well, we say that the derivative is a linear operation, so the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. I don't actually think you've proved that in calculus, but hopefully that should be reasonably intuitive enough. Um, I don't know. It's honestly, I don't even know if that's intuitive. Um, anyways, just take it for granted for now. Um, so what we got to do is we essentially have to, um, write a relationship. So we know that x over six is equal to x plus l over 15, right? x plus l over 15. So at this point, we can sort of solve a little bit, right? We can at least get rid of, uh, multiply both sides by 3, I think. Turn this into a 2 and a 5. So this turns into 5 halves x is equal to x plus l. So this turns into 3 halves x is equal to L. And now we can apply, take the derivative of both sides. So this turns into 3 halves uh, dx dt is equal to dl dt. So we know what dl dt is. That's given to us in the problem. That's just whatever, remember, that's just whatever speed the person's actually walking. Um, so I think we said earlier that that was 5 meters a second. And that lets us solve for dx dt. So now we have two perfectly valid numbers. This just turns into like, um, I think it turns into two thirds times five. And at this point, we know what both dx dt are, and the answer is just going to be the sum of them. So I hope that makes sense. 
Uh, does uh, that make can sense? Can you explain one more time why it went from five halves to three halves? Oh yeah. Um, sorry, that's uh, that's not so mis. I'm literally just subtracting the x from the other side. I I'm literally oh, okay, just subtracting okay. x from both sides. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No worries. But uh, does the explanation about how there are sort of like two factors at play here make sense? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I think. Uh, that actually took me a moment to get over because I was really confused for a moment why the answer wouldn't just be dx dt. And I started playing around with um, rel sort of relative motion in my head. But uh, that's a little bit too hard. And you can kind of think of this problem as the entire thing being the sum of L and x. And whatever the speed of, ch sorry, the rate of change of this point right here. Sorry, you can basically think of this point, uh, x, uh, sorry, position on the axis as being L plus X, right? This, this point is literally just L plus X and whatever axis it is. And you just want to get the change of it. So it's just derivative of L plus X times DT. And this kind of, thinking about it this way, kind of like divorces all physical meaning from the problem, which, you know, an uh, enlightened physicist would tell you was terrible. But if you want to just get to the answer, you can kind of think of it that way. Right. Okay. I guess that's all. Any other problems? I, um... I think I'm good. Okay. Very good. Well, uh, well, best of luck to you and all the other students who probably will watch the recording. Um, I, yeah, I realize that, uh, you know, when students get the, sorry, when I tell students that there is a recording available, they tend not to show up live because they know it'll be there later. And I think that's fine. Um, I'll let students go at this, whatever their own pace or schedules dictate. But uh, it's nice to have sort of one person to check me to make sure my explanations uh, make sense to a student and whatnot. So I appreciate you sticking it out. Yeah, thank you for everything. Yeah, well, take care.